we're recording. Hello, kings and queens. You are tuned in to the first installment of our Seasons and Shifts episodes for the Affirmations of Excellence podcast. And I am your guide, Ariel Ellis. I am so excited to present this series to you uh, with some of the leading voices in spiritual and personal and professional development. As you know, when one season is up and another one begins, life can get really, really uncertain. And when that shift comes about, it's time for us to figure out ways to get equipped to navigate the change. So in this series, our guests will be sharing some very critical insights on important topics in our lives that can position us to expect the extraordinary in new seasons, as well as to pursue excellence. So you'll be hearing from our guests, but you'll also be hearing um, specifically some insights from me on certain topics. And we're just going to have a conversation. One of the most important things for me as I think about ways that I have shaped my life, and, and many of you who follow me and who know me know that I'm an entrepreneur, and entrepreneurship is very important to me and always has been since I was a kid. In fact, I'll share this with our guests in a little bit, but my first business was when I was 14, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that business was. But entrepreneurship and, and community, as well as the African-American community specifically, community specifically has always been a priority for me as an African-American woman. And there's one particular person who I always admired, and that's Madam C.J. Walker. And I am delighted today to have uh, her great, great granddaughter, um, Alelia Bundles, who has recently um, produced, if you will, um, the new series on Netflix called Self Made. She's also the author of On Her Grant On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, which was a 2001 New York Times notable book about uh, the entrepreneurial pursuits and the accomplishments of, of uh, Madam C.J. Walker. Um, what's really interesting about the series is that it goes through these different, of course it's scripted, but it goes through these different uh, uh, experiences and it goes through these different stories in the life of Madam C.J. Walker. And one of the things that she embodied as well as what you'll hear from uh, Alelia today is excellence. And so that's really important. One of the things that I thought was really important to highlight. Alelia is a busy woman. Not only is she uh, curating and, uh, and preserving the legacy of Madam C.J. Walker, she is working on her fifth book. It is called The Joy Goddess of Harlem, Alelia Walker and the Harlem Renaissance. It is specifically about her great grandmother whose parties, arts patronage, and international travels help define the Harlem Renaissance. Everyone, help me welcome Alelia Bundles. Hi, Alelia. Hi, I'm so glad to be here with you. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, we, as I said before, are in a little bit of a shift now in our world, a lot of a shift. We're experiencing some things we haven't experienced before with this global pandemic. And it definitely uh, allowed me to be awakened in some ways and think about ways in which the content on the podcast and the book that I'm producing is, is being presented and the feedback that the audience was giving. And so it was really important for me to think, you know, let's open this up and have some conversations with people who have had their own experiences with excellence, but also have experienced some challenges and gone through various seasons and shifts. Um, in your background, you are former television a network executive. You've worked at ABC News and NBC News. You've done a variety of different things. And so if you would just kind of share with us, you know, as you've navigated different seasons and shifts in your life, what kind of signals and signs kind of appear for you when you know it's kind of time for a change? Uh, you know, is it the thing in the pit of your stomach that tells you you need to move on? I, you know, I certainly in my career and in personal life had moments when I knew that something that I was doing was not really the right thing for me. And sometimes it takes a little while. You have to sit with it and realize, you know, I have, what have I done? What kind of decisions have I made that put me in this position? Or were these some things beyond my control? And then what do I need to do to get out of them? And I'm thinking in particular of a couple of you know, job situations where I had been, you know, luckily I had, you know, great grades in school and went to Harvard for undergraduate school, went to Columbia to the journalism school, to one of the best journalism schools uh, in the world, really. 
Uh, but then you get out into the working world. And I was really fortunate to have some good experience with bosses. And then I hit a wall. And I hit a wall in particular with a person who became my boss. I was in the Houston Bureau, really small bureau. I'd had these great mentors, but they had moved on to other jobs. And the person who came in was really kind of mediocre. Mm -hmm. And he had been demoted from a bigger bureau. And to add uh, insult to injury from his perspective, he had been replaced by the first black woman bureau chief in the Chicago Bureau. So he was really not feeling me. And I could see through him, and I think he saw that, um, that I say so he was really just kind of, you know, not really up to the task. But I had a pretty miserable year and a half while I had to deal with him. But what I did was to not blow up, but to make a plan. And the plan was, how am I going to get out of here? How am I going to navigate? Who am I going to talk to? What, how am I going to pitch myself? And I did that. Uh, and then I moved on and then things were great for another few years and I was in bureaus. And then I had another situation. I'd moved to Washington with NBC, then I switched over to ABC and things were going well. And then I had another uh, boss who uh, was, you know, nothing I did really worked. And so then I made a plan and moved on from that, but I didn't tell the person, I just made a plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you were going through that difficult time, what was your source of encouragement or, or, or support? Well, in, when, in the first situation, my dad really was the person who kept saying, you know, you can handle this and you're still, you just need to do a good job. And I complained to him and I'm like, you just really don't understand. <laughs> But he was, he was absolutely right. And my mother, who had actually died a few years earlier, used to say, you know, you can live three days in hell <laughs> and then you can get out. Mm -hmm. And I always kept that in mind. But the other part is just um, meditation, which is something that I do a great deal of now. And that helps me really get through difficult moments. And then having a circle of friends. Um, girlfriends are really essential to helping me, you know, understand, listening to their wisdom. Yeah, that's important. You have to have a great circle of people around you. And of course, you're going to have those times where, as you mentioned about your father, that you will have folks who are close to you who don't really understand the transition that you're going through uh, and don't understand the shifts that are taking place at that particular moment. Um, once you kind of got over that phase, um, you had some things that you had learned and some things that you could take away from that. Um, how did you kind of navigate the takeaways? How did you start to see those takeaways come to be really uh, reflective and useful in your career going forward? But one of the things that I realized when I hit these in a few situations, I, I think there's sort of three moments in my career where I really hit a wall. And it, it was really a personality conflict. It wasn't that my work wasn't good. It's that I hit somebody who, with whom I didn't get along. And when I hit those moments, part of my plan was to be involved in other things. And I got really involved in college alumni activities, both with my college and with my undergraduate school. And in those situations, I began to have leadership opportunities. So while I was getting blocked at work in my career, even though I was continuing to try to do a good job, I wasn't being given some leadership roles. So I worked on those leadership roles. And then ultimately, another door opened in the workplace where another person could see that I was doing leadership roles ex outside, externally, and tapped me to become deputy bureau chief of the Washington Bureau. <laughs> yeah. So it's the one monkey don't stop no show. But there are always, even if you hit a wall, there is something else you can do, whether it's your side hustle, but something that keeps feeding you. Yeah. And, and really mentoring other people is one way to, to do that. You're, you're moving forward even when something is blocking you. That's so true. Um, when you, how did you know that it was time to transition from uh, television news. Ha, 
That's a great question because I, I worked in television news for 30 years. And when I started, it was the ancient times because there were only three networks. It was ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS, mm -hmm. but it was before cable. So that meant you worked at one of the three major news organizations and there wasn't a lot of other competition. And so news was really important, but as the cable uh, operations became more prominent, then news began to change and it began to be much more about uh, entertainment and eyeballs and how much money could be made. So before it was the lost leader and kind of a prestige thing. Mm -hmm. Then it became, you know, Britney Spears and, and OJ Simpson trial. Those were things, the kind of sensational stuff and then reality TV. So I feel very lucky that I was in news and in journalism during that period of time when news was really taken seriously. Now, I will say we are in another phase now where it's a whole lot of different things. There's some fabulous journalism going on at NPR and PBS and ProPublica and um, a lot of places that are, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, that are doing really great journalism, but there's also a lot of junk that's going on. And when I got to that 30-year mark, I really was ready I had something else that I wanted to do. I wanted to write this new book that I'm working on now. So that was, I had something both pulling me mm -hmm. and I had something pushing me because at that point I had become director of talent development and I was helping to nurture the next generation. But I also was having to fit into some boxes because Disney had taken over ABC News and the work that I was doing to try to do some career development for other people didn't really mesh with what Disney's uh, idea was. And mm -hmm. I thought, okay, well, I've done this. I've made a contribution. I have something else that I want to do. So now it is time for me to go. Wow. The, that's interesting that you said you were working in talent development and working with grooming, the grooming process for the next generation. And you're right, that transition from uh, information to infotainment uh, in news and in journalism has shifted dr drastically um, to the point where we don't really know what's what. <laughs> we don't know <laughs> what's true, what's false. Uh, we don't really know how to classify. We don't have any real media literacy anymore. Um, speak, speak a little bit more about that transition and if perhaps that was difficult or uncomfortable for you and how did you persevere in that transition? Yeah, well, you know, and I think we're in a, an, an insane time really to be honest right now because of the president we have and because of the disinformation and misinformation. That's on top of the fact that there is a profit that must be made by, by news division. So with the old model of ABC, CBS, NBC, NBC made the decision to go into cable and to develop MSNBC, which meant they were going to be, had something that was really very much focused on news 24-7, and CNN now was in the scene. ABC, where I worked for half of my career, first at NBC for six, 13 years, and then ABC for 16 years and change, ABC did not make that investment in a cable news station at early, when it needed to and before it was too late. So that meant that ABC was really kind of stuck with Good Morning America, Nightline, and World News Tonight. So that's just a few hours a day in a big network where NBC had a much bigger palette. Mm -hmm. And I could see with the premier um, program with World News Tonight, that there was the little hole for news that was serious got smaller and smaller. There was also tension between the New York operation, which was headquarters for the news division, and Washington, D.C., where New York always had this tension where Washington news really was kind of boring from, mm -hmm. from their perspective. Um, and it was the White House, Capitol Hill. Now, to me, those things are really important because they make a huge difference. But now ABC has changed so much that they barely have uh, a Washington operation. So that, those kinds of things, the things that I think are really important to cover in news, those things were less and less important. And that's got to be difficult because you spent all that time building a career 
uh, taking your career seriously and, and developing content that you feel is important for the American or the general public to know. And then all of a sudden that thing does not have as much value as it once had. And right, it's then, right. It doesn't have as much value in that arena, but it still has value in so many other places. So you just pivot. And all of those things that I learned for that 30 years when I was working in network television news are things that I use every single day. You know, when I'm looking at doing a Zoom interview, I have my lighting. <laughs> my lighting will, is not as professional as the professional lighting people. But I know those things. I know about sound bites. I know how to, I'm not, you know, the best person on Instagram and Twitter. I don't have millions of followers, but I know how to get a message out. And certainly that storytelling that I learned during those years as a journalist is something that I use in writing my books and in promoting my books. Absolutely. Talk about the book. When did the book, first book come about? Um, which I read several years ago, and then I read. I, I actually, I'm an audiobook person now, so I I, uh, I listened again uh, right before I reached out to you when the movie uh, or the Netflix series came out. I actually pulled it up on Audible and listened this time. Um, so say say more about the book and the transition into being an author. Again, you're a journalist. You're a journalist at heart. You're a storyteller at heart. I can relate to that. I am too. Um, so speak about that transition from, you know, television to, you know, uh, the written, the written word and, and writing a story, telling a story that was very, very personal to you. Well, listen, I thank you so much for listening to the audio book. I, I did that in February, mm -hmm. right before the Netflix series came out because it, the book on her own ground was written and came out in 2001. And we didn't do an audio book at the time. So I'm, I was really pleased to be able to do that. And again, my, my skills in journalism, having been a producer and having really coached other people to do their audio tracks, the shoe was on the other foot. And it was really kind of an enjoyable experience for me. And I'm really pleased to see that the audio book sales are really doing well. So I'm, and I'm a big audio book person as well. So I'm, I'm, again, thank you so much for listening. The very first book that I wrote about Madam Walker came out in 1991. Mm -hmm. I did a young adult biography as part of a series called Black Americans of Achievement. And that was really, believe it or not, the first book ever written about Madam Walker. But that's the way the publishing industry was and that's the way history was taught. Women and people of color really, you know, were kind of off to the side, were really pretty erased and marginalized. But that came out in 91. And I had uh, a few years earlier, I'd written my ma master's paper at Columbia in Journalism School about Madam Walker. And then I met Alex Haley in the early 80s. And he pitched a, a mini series about Madam Walker. He was still riding the crest of roots and he wanted to do um kind of a fictionalized version of madam walker's life and i became his researcher for that i took nine months off from my job at nbc as a producer in atlanta and moved to new york for a few months did that research but alex never finished a book which i think was the way the universe planned it um we became he became a mentor we spent time on his farm we developed these ideas but after he died in uh, 92. My young adult book had already come out in 91, and I had met his editor for Roots, Lisa Drew. And Lisa acquired my book, the book that ultimately became On Her Own Ground, that now is the inspiration for Self Made. In between, I'd written, I wrote two other books. So when Madam C.J. Walker, Entrepreneur, was the first one in 91, then On Her Own Ground came out in 2001. Then I did another children's book that came out in 2008, 16, 17, and then in between a book called Madam Walker Theater Center, which, which is an Arcadia book with 200 photographs. And now I'm almost finished with the uh, Alelia Walker biography. But that transition, you know, I knew that the story needed to be told. I'm really fortunate that I had the only black woman on the faculty at Columbia Mm -hmm. Phyllis Garland, a journalist who recognized my name, Alelia, that A apostrophe capital L-E-L-I-A, 
and realized that I had a connection to Madam Walker. And she's the one who planted the seed and validated it for me that I needed to write this book. So on holidays and weekends and vacations, I did research for many, many years. Mm, wow. I know the pain of writing a book. Uh, <laughs> um, talk about that process. What did it feel like for you? Well, you know, I think that it is, um, you know, you become possessed. I think there is a certain, like, you know, it's obsessive to do the amount of research that's necessary. But each step along the way, I just knew that this story needed to be told. And I knew the ancestors in many ways wanted their voices to be heard. And so I felt that sense of mission about telling the story. And I always found the energy. I will say that this book that I'm writing now is taking an embarrassingly long time <laughs> to finish writing. I have been working on it. I don't even want to tell you how many years I've been working on it, but it's germinated. And along the way, I, I've taken the research that I had done on for my Madam Walker book. I've expanded it. I've pivoted it to try to look at the world through Alelia Walker's eyes. And I will say that there are, you know, obstacles. In the fall of 2018, I had cleared my calendar, no trips all for the rest of the year. And I was going to just do blitz to finish the book. I had 25 chapters done, and that's what I was going to do. And I, on the third Sunday of September in 2018, my father's wife sent an email to tell me the details of my father's diagnosis of Lewy body dementia. Mm. So we knew he'd been having cognitive issues, but this was now the diagnosis. And I texted my brother, I had two brothers and the one to whom I was closest. And I said, give me a call so I can, we can talk before I call Helen, daddy's wife. And I didn't hear from him all day. And then I got a call from him that evening and he was in the emergency room mm. and he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. So the next nine months were, was really about family. And I thought I could write a book, but you know, you have to stop sometimes. So my father died in March, March 26. My brother died June 19th and my other brother died suddenly on August 2nd. So within 18 weeks, I lost all of them. Now, in the meantime, you know, I just like how in the world, people are saying, said to me, how can you go through that? And this was meditation. This was trying to process it, to realize what were the, the gratitude that I felt about my father's long life, the gratitude that I felt about being able to spend time with my brother as he was going through his treatments and the good friends who surrounded us. And now I look back and I think if I had been going through that this year, it, I don't even have any concept of how I would have dealt with it. But it is when you say that, you know, where do you find the strength? And it is um, the closeness, the kindness of friends. It's for me, meditation. It's understanding that there is something bigger than all of us in the universe that is going to keep us is going to be a safety net for us that's so interesting that all of that happened all at once and you were able to determine ways to persevere and you mentioned meditation if you don't mind share a little bit more about your process and mm -hmm. what meditation has done for you so this was um i mean you can sort of tell from my conversation i am not a big church goer um, but I certainly do have this sense of a higher power. You know, I believe in God, um, but I'm not involved in a regular church family. But I realized that I needed something to ground me. I've always had that sort of general sense, but I was having, you know, just so much kind of anxiety um, about what was happening with my family. And I came upon, I started listening to apps, to Insight Timer and Calm and some of these apps and those people talking through having intention, um, getting rid of stress, 
thinking about a higher power. And one of the things that has been really important for me is a chakra meditation. So mm -hmm. looking at, and I'm already, I was already doing yoga classes. I was going to yoga classes, which I've been doing for about 10 years. And so that, the chakra meditation that really looks at the spiritual part of you, the physical part of you, and how you do deep breathing to center yourself and to connect yourself to the universe is what works for me. Yeah. And how frequently are you plugged into that meditation? Do you have a specific practice? Um, what, are you still participating in yoga? What's, what's kind of maybe your daily or your weekly routine? So I do, the, I do it every day. Every morning I am listening to, there's a, there's a particular chakra meditation that's about 40 minutes. And so on some days I listen to the full thing because it takes you through each of the seven chakras. And, you know, it starts with the base and then it gets you, you know, it takes you through the higher spiritual um, elevation. My yoga class has been suspended because of COVID. And so I'm trying to make time to do that. And I have to say that I'm not doing a very good job of it. I was going to the gym every single day. There's a gym that's a block and a half from me. And now and I would do the elliptical. So that was another way to get rid of stress and to sort of keep me centered. And I haven't found anything that really replaces it. I am doing as kind of a jog run every day, but I don't really like that. And it's really been kind of cold and rainy for the last few weeks, but I'm, I'm having a sense of trying to get a new routine. And I think many of us are doing that. The self-care routines that we had that were working for us um, are having to, we're having to um, realign. And I'm, and I realize how fortunate I am that I'm not really dealing with whether I have a job. You know, I'm at retirement age, though I'm not retired, but I'm in that sense of I don't have to go to a job mm -hmm. or I won't lose a job, but I just can't even imagine trying to juggle all these things and what people are doing when their children are now at home and they're having to do school and work and take care of the household and not have any outlet. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you think in, in, in the same um, kind of vein of that thread, do you think that as we talk about transformation and reinvention, do you think that this will be a time for us to kind of ponder over what that looks like for our lives? Is this, is this a time for transformation and reinvention? Or perhaps is, is, is this a time for reflection and uh, just an opportunity to be still? What are your thoughts? I think it, it's all of the above. I think that we are, whether we are planning it or not, we are being transformed. Mm -hmm. This is beyond anything that certainly in my lifetime I've ever experienced. And you know, we've been through, 9-11 was a big blow. Mm -hmm. But there was, I think, enough unity, not entirely, because we have, we have a very diverse country, but enough sense of, we've been attacked. We have to get through this. Um, the things that have always happened to Black people, the kind of racism and, you know, difficulties that we go through, that didn't go away during that period of time. But I think there was this sense of we're going to get to the other side. And then with the economic crisis, when so many people had bought homes and they were losing homes, that was a huge disruption. Mm -hmm. But this is worldwide and it is weaponized and it is racialized because we see that Black people are dying in disproportionate amounts. And that will have an impact on our election. Uh, the people who now are nervous about going out, the numbers, the communities that have been disrupted, the uh, difficult racist policies of the Trump administration means that we're going to be disenfranchised even more, which means that we have to, at this moment when we may be feeling weakest, mm -hmm. we have to dig deeper to feel stronger because our survival depends on it. It also is a time when, I mean, Toni Morrison said this, I can't have the, I don't have the, the quote, but essentially this is a time when artists do some of their best work under duress because you realize that you have to dig deeper to find creativity 
to survive. And I think that, you know, as a people, we, whether it's our music, whether it's our art, whether it's our dance, that we are doing things to build ourselves up. I love it. I love it. And I, I am a, a Toni Morrison um, follower and have read her for a long time, ever since I was a kid. But there's someone else who I, as I said earlier, adored as I was growing up. And that was Madam C.J. Walker. I just knew that somehow, some way, that a little bit of her legacy was going to be embedded in me. <laughs> as a kid, I mentioned earlier, as a kid, I would see, you know, the stories. I may have been about nine or 10 years old. I would see the stories. I would see the documentaries and things on C uh, PBS, right? And I would read the stories about her. And I was so fascinated um, because of her success. Uh, she she looked like, you know, the, the Black women in my family and in my church and my neighborhood. And to know that she was this cosmetics and hair care mogul uh, was just, it, it was mind blowing for me as a child. And I took interest in entrepreneurship as a result of kind of learning her story. And eventually, uh, when I was about 14 or so, I started to do hair and give manis and petties in my house. Love it. And I earned a lot of money doing that as a 14 year old. And uh, it, and it taught me so much. It taught me a lot of the things that I'm sure, like the things that I've read in the book, uh, the things that I, that, that I picked up on in the mini series, it taught me uh, how to communicate, how to uh, relate to people, how to service people with the things that they needed most, how to make people feel good and feel better about themselves. And not only it taught me those things, but it brought out some of the natural qualities and abilities I already had. And so now, you know, 20 some years later, having transitioned into an official business owner in so many ways, that story and her legacy just sticks with me. Um, speak about your, uh, your grandmother's legacy, because in many ways, for most of us, she was the mother of invention. Talk about her legacy a little bit. Well, I love that you are telling your story and that she inspired you because that's what motivates me to continue to tell her story and to share it and his story of empowerment of other women. So this is something I, that there wasn't enough of in the mini series for me, but it's very much a part of my message about her. When she was a poor washerwoman, Sarah Breedlove moved from Delta, Louisiana to St. Louis in the late 1880s and her joining her brothers who were barbers. And her brother's barbershop was very near St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. And it was really the women of the church who began to give Sarah Breedlove a vision of herself as something other than an illiterate washerwoman mm -hmm. who insisted that, her, that she educate her daughter. And apparently she had a good enough singing voice that she was in the choir. So you know the kind of nurturing that goes on in the choir. And she was a member of the missionary society. She might have only had a penny or a nickel to give, but she began to learn about philanthropy and about giving back. And the club women of the church were, were the models, the role models for her that she used years later as she developed her organization. So it was this she was empowered, she was mentored, she was nurtured. And then she turned around and used that model for others. Mm -hmm. In 1917, when she had her first convention of her sales agents, national convention, at the convention, she gave prizes, not just to the women who sold the most products, but to the women who contributed the most to charity. And she told her agents, I want you to understand that your first duty is to humanity. I want others to look at us and realize that we care not just about ourselves, but about others. And at the end of the convention, the women sent a telegram to President Woodrow Wilson, urging him to support legislation to make lynching a federal crime. So hair care was important, hair products were important, but over time, I think it became a means to an end where she realized that the women wanted some hair care products, yes, but they needed education and economic independence. That's amazing. And to know that the business that she built 
and the people that she employed and the people that she, uh, not only people she employed, but the service, the, the people that she serviced uh, were able to create this social justice conversation to be able to shift again, be able to shift um, some, something very important in culture for our people. Like that's huge. Um, well, and you know, it is your, like, what you're saying, you learned something about yourself, about giving service and performing a service, but it was healing scalps was also about healing souls. That's right. About nurturing. And that social justice piece, your community is the bigger part of your soul. And that sort of carried forward even for many generations where uh, a good friend of mine, Tiffany Gill, who's written a book called, she's a professor at University of Delaware, has written a book called Beauty Shop Politics. And she traces that social justice um, impulse all the way to the March on Washington, where the beauticians, the National Beauty Cultures League, helped pay for the buses for the March on Washington. So you could see that was carrying through. Yeah. Uh, wow. That, I didn't know that. That's a, that's a very important little known fact. Wow. I think what's also interesting is that if we look at the miniseries, now some folks will will know, of course, many folks will know the name Madam C.J. Walker, um, but I think there's a new generation, the Netflix generation, if you will, or Netflix watchers, um, who have a new interest in her story and have a new interest in people like her and what she was able to create. Uh, talk about the process of building the series and having influence in the series and being able to reintroduce her story. Again, we're talking about transformation and reinvention. She's now been, you know, uh, as a brand, she has transformed, essentially. She's been re reinvented in a way because she's been reintroduced. She's been character characterized in a, in a different kind of way. So say a little bit more about the, the Netflix series and how that created some new inspiration for her story. Well, first of all, having Octavia Spencer in the lead role is perfect. <laughs> she really embodies Madam Walker's courage and tenacity and strength. And you get this sense of what it takes to build a business, that it, you have a vision and you have obstacles and you have to make sacrifices. And then the payoff is that you are helping other people. So it is great to be able to see that. There are, obviously it is a fictionalized version and there are made up characters and made up scenes and things that didn't happen. But it does mean that millions of people who never had heard of Madam Walker now know her name. And some people who, you know, I thought about as the series was being developed, I thought about the kids who, uh, who've written their National History Day reports and award winners. I thought about the cosmetologist who helped us with the 1998 stamp campaign that allowed us to get a Madam Walker stamp, about the scholars who were writing their dissertations that turned into books, and about entrepreneurs like you who are inspired by Madam Walker. And I knew that people had some expectations about the series. So I'm hoping that they saw it, they were entertained, and now they want to dig a little bit uh, deeper and mm -hmm. find out some of the facts about Madam Walker's life. You know, th my podcast is about excellence. And for me, and for many others, but particularly for me, I can speak for myself, Madam C.J. Walker is the epitome of excellence. Um, what does it mean for you to carry that legacy and to make sure that that excellence continues? She would say that part of the secret to her success was having a high quality product. So we start, we start there. And then to promote the product and to do it in the classiest way possible with advertisements, with a message, with a way that empowers women. And then to surround yourself with leaders, with people who are really good at what they do. And her C-suite, her executive team, was filled with people who were at the top of their game. She didn't suffer fools well, but she did, I think, sort of navigate, how do you bring someone along who may not already be at the top of their game. I mean, she tried to 
see things with the people who were at the top of the game, but she also knew she had been one of those people who needed nurturing. And how do you help somebody? But her secretary, who was who had started working for her when she was a teenager in 1914, was my neighbor, and she was still working for the company in the 1970s, which she was an old, old woman. But she would tell me stories about Madam Walker, and one of them was her own interest in lifelong education and self-improvement. Her attorney wrote her a letter while she was traveling, and he said, the next time you're in Indianapolis, we have to go to the bank, and you have to sign a new signature card, because the bank, your handwriting has improved so much, the bank is not sure it's you. When she was in town, the office girls liked to be around her to learn from her, and they would read the newspaper together in the morning. And if somebody didn't understand a word, they would look up the word. There was no shame in not knowing the shame would have been in not trying to get better and not trying to not trying to improve yourself so those were some of her secrets to success it's that you you may not know but you can learn and surround yourself with people who can help enhance you yeah that's beautiful uh, another extension of her excellence is now the products that are available that bear her name and other initiatives that uh, carry her name and her her image and her likeness, uh, and and that also fits right into the transformation, the reinvention of her brand and her story. Say more about about that and what it means to um, not only in in media and, and and in books, but to keep reintroducing her legacy um, by way of other products and and by way of other initiatives that get community the community engaged and involved. Well, yeah, I think Madam Walker's having a moment. And I just, you know, this is kind of a 50-year journey for me, where I wrote my first paper about her and about her daughter in 1970, when I was a senior in high school. But each step along the way, it was really just about trying to do the best I could to tell the story. I knew she was amazing. And sometimes other people understood, and sometimes they didn't. But I was just keeping, let's just keep moving. And so now we have all of these wonderful initiatives, the Netflix series, four books, almost five. Madam Walker's home in Irvington, New York, is a National Historic Landmark and a National Trust uh, for Historic Preservation National Treasure. And the Madam Walker Legacy Center in Indianapolis has just undergone a $15 million renovation, has a beautiful theater and a ballroom and a nonprofit, and then the Indiana Historical Society has almost 50,000 documents, many of which we donated to the Historical Society. 40,000 have been digitized, and there's a new Madam Walker exhibit. Wow. And then the products, which is just like all of the pieces have come together. Mm -hmm. um, Richelieu Dennis, the founding CEO of Sundial Brands, which makes Shea Moisture and Nubian Heritage, as many people knew, know, grew up in Liberia. And when he came to the United States to go to college in the late 80s, he had heard of Madam Walker and wondered what had happened with the products. When he graduated from Babson College in 91, his mother had come. They could not go back to Liberia because of the war. And they started using his grandmother's shea butter recipe, mm -hmm. selling it on 125th and 5th and made it a very successful company. And then he found his way to discovering what had happened with the Walker products. My family had been involved until the early 80s. There was another company that owned the trademark for about 30 years. And then Rich bought the trademark from them and then involved me as the brand historian. And they are fabulous products. Um, it is not the original formula. That's what people ask me. But the original formula was revolutionary 100 years ago. But it was like Vaseline with sulfur because that was what was needed to heal scalp infections when people didn't have indoor plumbing and they had a lot of bad scalp infections. But now, 100 years later, we realize that what our hair needs is moisture, exfoliation, conditioning. We used to run from water and moisture, but we know that we, if used properly, our hair needs moisture. And these 20 products in the MCJW line uh, are just 
wonderful and make your hair healthy. And I use them on my hair. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, it's it, to hear you say a hundred years later, man, that is, that, that really moves me to know that you come from and you're sharing with us this legacy that we all feel like we kind of come from. I share with you my story that we all can share in this legacy of a woman who a hundred years ago was so transformational and so groundbreaking and so just out of the box in fulfilling a void, filling a need for her community. Um, and all of the accomplishes, accomplishments that she made, not only in the community and not only in business, but in social justice. And to know that that legacy is still going, it really is just mind blowing in a lot of ways. So I'm, I'm grateful that you are a part of that legacy and that you're continuing to preserve it and that you're continuing to share it with us so that we can feel like we own a little piece of it. You know, well, you know, I always have had this sense that Madam Walker really belonged to the world. That the, it was, you think, 13 years between the time she went from washerwoman to millionaire, from living in a shack to living in a mansion in the wealthiest community in America. But in the meantime, transforming other women and bringing them along with her. And these women of her church who set an example for her, the spiritual foundation that they set for her and how she was able to use that to uplift other women and to mm -hmm. uplift her community. It's beautiful. As we wrap up, I, I would love to get a, a, an idea from you about how excellence and the pursuit of it rings true in your life as you navigate new seasons and you go through different shifts what words of affirmations really stick with you as you continue to pursue excellence you know i there's a there's a poem called desiderata that i um read from time to time it was written in 1927 and it starts go placidly amidst the noise and haste and to just stay centered and to speak your truth and to avoid loud people and you know just to sort of keep yourself centered that's really important for me but i also really do believe in giving your best there are a lot of times when i have to say no because i know that i'm stretched too thin and sometimes i say yes even when i am stretched too thin but I really, and I don't want to say I'm a perfectionist, but because I'm, you know, maybe I am to a degree, probably I am. But it is, I, when I commit to doing something, I want to make sure that I am doing it well, that I am giving people my best. Mm -hmm. And Madam Walker said that when people asked her to, the secret to her success, she would say to them, there is no royal flower strewn path to success. And if there is, I have not found it. For whatever success I have attained has been the result of much hard work and many sleepless nights. I got my start by giving myself a start. So don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. You have to get up and make them for yourself. Wow, that was beautiful. I am so grateful that you had an opportunity or took an opportunity to talk to me uh, and to uh, share uh, your thoughts about excellence and pursuing that in the midst of seasons and shifts and how transformation and reinvention has been a part of your life and, and some of the takeaways that we can use as we go through that process ourselves. Um, as you said earlier, we both talked about how we're in a really interesting time right now. And so trying to figure out how to navigate these seasons and shifts are really critical. And thinking about how transformation and reinvention fits into that is important. And it just so happens that we get to relive the Madam C.J. Walker legacy uh, as a result of the Netflix series and the new uh, audio book, as well as the book that's coming forth from you in the midst of all of this. So we have more and more inspiration and more and more excellence to witness. Thank you again uh, for uh, for being one of my first guests on the uh, on the podcast. And I'm really grateful that you took the time to share with me.
Well, what a blessing that you reached out to me. And I'm just so glad to know about the work you're doing. And I look forward to staying in touch. Excellent. Thank you so much.